happy that uh, Mike was so patient and persistent in uh, scheduling and rescheduling this meeting with us because it's a very important topic for the Committee on Diversity, Equity, Inclusion. And um, I shared with Mike our, our set of questions that we asked him to consider um, and share, share his reflections on tonight. So uh, those questions have to do with the topic of diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism and how, how those issues impact his professional practice. Um, we asked him to think about the resource issue, what resources he has, what resources he wished he had, and how we as a committee in Hadley can actually partner with him and support him in his work. So um, I'm just I'm really happy to, to see Mike. I was really happy to talk with him um, by phone and um, I'll turn it over to him, Chief Mason. Great, uh, thank you very much, Pat. I appreciate the, uh, the multiple attempts to, to have this meeting. Uh, I'm glad that we are, are finally able to, uh, to meet. Um, so yes, I did uh, in my um, couple of different conversations uh, via email and on the phone with Pat, um, she did pass along some excellent questions from this committee. And I think uh, you even reached out to some other folks um, to get some, some good, good questions for me and for the, for the agency and the direction that we're heading and the things that we do. So you have probably seen some of the emails that, um, uh, that I sent out uh, over the course of the summer and, um, and into the spring. Um, so you may have kind of a, a, a good, well-rounded idea of where I'm going to go and what I'm going to discuss today. So for those of you who this is kind of a double up, I apologize. If you're bored, uh, feel free to log off. They are recording this so you can watch it later. <laughs> But uh, generally speaking, uh, one of the things that I hit on and one of the things that was specifically requested that I talk about is um, how, how our department, the things that we do to try to kind of build trust and, and build the, you know, bridge the gap uh, with our community that we serve. Um, one of the things specifically was the six pillars of uh, President Obama's 21st century policing report. Uh, President Obama put together a task force and they, they came out with um, what they call the 21st Century Policing Report, where they put together best practices and they put together some ideals um, that really kind of were hoping police departments would aim for uh, when, you know, they move forward to try to, to, try to build that, that uh, trust with the communities that they serve. So what I did was I took those six pillars and I, I put them in a couple of different emails to some folks. And I think Pat uh, probably has one of them. I'm sure she's filtered it around to, to everybody by now. But um, I kind of wanted to go through those things. I think it's really important to kind of show how we view what those six pillars mean and the things that we can do um, to kind of reach those pillars. A lot of this is really dependent upon personnel. Uh, some of it's dependent upon funding. And so that's where I hope this group comes in. Um, that's what the original request when we wanted to take this meeting um, came from was how, you know, I, I was gonna kind of lay out for you folks what we do. And then we were gonna talk about how maybe you could help uh, in certain areas. So, the six pillars are, are this, uh, building trust and legitimacy, policy and oversight, technology and social media, community police production, officer training and education, which I'm sure everybody knows is a big one, and officer safety and wellness. And how we approach each one of these is, is different than how a, a large department would, would approach them. We don't have the personnel to, to attack these pillars the way that we would hope. So what we try to do is as much resources at it as we have available to us to try to have the big bang for our buck, so to speak. So when it comes to building trust and legitimacy, that 21st century uh, policing report talked about a few things and it talked about um, getting in touch with your community uh, when it comes to this area. The community needs to know who the officers are. Um, these are the kinds of things that build trust. You know, when you see a, when you see a police officer, you see that face 
and you know their name, that is a step in the right direction. So we try to attend as many community events as we possibly can. Um, we work really, we work really well with our um, uh, the select board and the board of health and the park and rec department. And I'm sure you've probably seen on social media that not only do we go to these community events, we actually run a lot of them. Um, we've never had school resource officers before, not before I took over. We started a school resource officer program uh, when I took over, not because we need police officers in the school. Um, I'm not super worried that we're gonna have some type of catastrophic incident that a police officer needs to be there for something like that. The idea of school resource officers in our school in our schools is specifically to act in a mentor role. These officers, we, we actually have memorandums of understanding with the superintendent, with the district attorney's office, with the school systems, that that is not the goal of these police officers. They are not there to act as disciplinarians. They are there to be a different face, a different person that a student with student who's having problems or a student in crisis can go talk if they feel comfortable doing so. That is a huge item that uh, we're using to try to build that trust. And we have our school resource officers are in all of the schools in town, the elementary school, uh, the uh, Hopkins Academy, uh, and, the, and even the private schools in town, the Chinese Immersion School as well. Um, the officers throughout COVID were doing um, birthday parades. I'm sure you probably saw that. Uh, they, uh, throughout the entire summer of COVID, they um, got together. People could reach out to us, um, reach out on Facebook, request a parade. We would drive by a, a young child's house, honk the horn, flash the lights, you know, uh, hit the siren, just to try to make small gestures like that uh, to show that there are real people behind these badges. Um, we started delivering meals for our seniors, uh, senior citizens for the, um, the senior center when their volunteers dried up uh, throughout COVID. They're in the, they're in the um, vulnerable population. So we reached out and said, you know, how, how can we help kind of thing? That's one of the things we're actually still doing that uh, right now. The senior center has volunteers back. Uh, they can take back this, um, um, this have, but I've actually requested to the senior center director that we keep at least one day. Uh, some of my officers as well as myself have developed relationships with the folks that we deliver to. Um, and to be quite honest with you, I would be, I would feel kind of a gap because there's one particular person who I, I deliver to every time. Um, I make sure that I grab that lunch because I like to see how she's doing. Um, our officers have the same connection with some of these folks that they're delivering meals to. Uh, and I hope that they don't ever wanna take, uh, we do Wednesdays at 11 a.m. So if anybody's looking for a meal Wednesday at 11 a.m., call over to the Senior Center, I'll be happy to bring it to you. Uh, but those are the kinds of things that we do uh, here in, in, in this department. Uh, moving on to the next one, policy and oversight. So this one, um, for those of you who don't know, we are actually currently in what they call a self-assessment phase of uh, working towards accreditation. Let me just mute my, uh, my radio here. All right. So we're working towards um, a self, we're in a self-assessment phase of, of accreditation. And accreditation in Massachusetts is really kind of widely known as the pinnacle of best practices in law enforcement. It is very difficult to become accredited. First, you have to become what is called certified. There are over 100 items that we have to, whether it be policies, hiring practices, training, there are certain things that they select from the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Accreditation Commission that you have to fulfill. You have to live up to their standard, their high standard. And when you do that, you become certified. Once you become certified, then there are, I believe, 159 total 
um, items that you have to uh, fulfill and live up to the standard of to become accredited. When we become accredited, we will fulfill every requirement set forth and then some by the new police reform bill. The reason that we are pushing so hard to become accredited is because, as I mentioned to the finance committee a couple of weeks ago, I have no intention of being just good enough. Um, I have no intention of allowing this department to basically only fulfill what that reform bill set forth for how we are supposed to conduct ourselves and the things that we're supposed to do on paper. Um, that's not going to be good enough for me. And it's not good enough for our officers. I can tell you right now that a lot of police departments, when they want to try for accreditation, they're met with a lot of pushback from the union because there's a lot of things that are gonna change about how they have to conduct themselves. In this department, not one person said a single thing. We're required by labor, mass labor law to actually submit this item to the union so that they can do what's called impact bargaining. And all it really means is I submit them some paperwork that says we wanna be accredited, they are then allowed to say back to me, okay, we think this is going to affect our work life in this way, so we'd like something for that. Not a single officer had a problem with becoming accredited at all. There was no grievance. There was no complaints. They said, let's do this. It was the same with body cameras. It was the same with Narcan. These are all items that if, if I could... If I could just get all of you folks in here and have you meet these officers who work for you, you would be super happy with, with what you have because they actually care uh, about what they're doing for a living. And it's not easy to do that with everything that's going on today and all the noise uh, that they hear. Uh, so I wish I could just kind of transplant what I'm seeing, what my eyes see and the, and the folks that I know that serve you every day. Uh, I wish you could see what I see every day because it's amazing. Um, so that's where we're headed as far as policy and oversight goes. We're, we're headed to the highest level. The technology and social media pillar. Uh, this one, this one's tough because you need personnel to handle a lot of these things. You look at Boston, uh, you look at Springfield, look at all these places, they had a Facebook, they have an Instagram, they have uh, Twitter, you know, they have all this stuff because they have people that can man these things and actually make them useful for them. We have Facebook and it's, it's everything that we have to kind of stay up to speed on that thing. We have a few officers who do a really good job with the social media stuff, but we can only do so much. It's a small agency. Um, and we try to stay on top of it. The other part of the technology is uh, body cameras. Um, that's a huge one for us and for this area. We rolled out our full body camera program last summer. Um, there, to my knowledge, is no other agency in this area had a full body camera program, cruisers and officers uh, at that time, and there's still many that do not. Um, we love it. We, we, the, the officers had, the officers wanted body cameras. Uh, so there was no issue there. Um, so that's another thing that we're using to kind of build that trust and bridge that gap and show folks, Hey, you don't have to cell phone record us. We're doing it to ourselves. Um, you can, <laughs> you certainly can record us, but you know, we, we have a, uh, we're doing it ourselves. We're policing ourselves, so to speak. Uh, another pillar is the community policing and crime reduction. As I mentioned before, you know, school, school resource officers, these are things that, um, that we, we try to do just to try to, to try to community police. We want to know what's going on in the community. And sometimes some of the best ways to do that is to get to know the students, talk to the kids and see what's going on. Um, we also have a, I think it's a first of its kind program. I've never heard of another program like it. Um, where we actually have, I want to say, 
four or five officers right now who are certified as mediators. Um, we certified police officers specifically in mediation skills because we have neighbor disputes just like any other community. And a lot of times these neighbor disputes start off as something small and they build to a point where um, crimes happen. And that's kind of what we were aiming for is to try to stop it before it got to that point. So we've actually had a couple of successful situations where uh, we have our trained mediators, we'll send them out and we'll try to get these folks in a room together and actually mediate a situation the same way that a trained mediator would do uh, anywhere else. We have um, quite a few, for, for those of you who don't know, our, our Golden Court area and our Burke Way area, we have a lot of folks down there, neighbors who, who have issues. Um, we have a housing commission down there that some of, the, some of the folks down there don't feel represented. And some of them uh, don't feel represented because of their race, because of their gender, um, or a, a number of other things. And so we've actually sent mediators many times to those um, housing, uh, the, the, ha the housing authority meetings um, to try to solve some of those problems or at least calm some of the, some of the situations down. Uh, we haven't been able to do that in a while because of COVID. They haven't had any of those meetings recently, but those are the kinds of things that we try to do to get involved. Uh, and we send folks who have been trained to do those things uh, into those areas. We hold citizens police academies. We actually hold junior police academies um, to try to invite folks like you, uh, as well as kids, um, to just come in and learn a little bit about what it is that we do. Unfortunately, COVID, we've had to cancel the last few of those, but the first two or three that we ran were very, um, very well liked from what I understand. We do, um, uh, we have two officers who are certified in um, women's self-defense. It's called uh, RAD, R-A-D, Rape Aggression Defense. We can do class. We've actually worked with the schools to do classes for, um, you know, teen teenage girls. Uh, we've worked with the colleges uh, similarly to do that. Um, it's just another way that, you know, we can kind of bridge that gap and show folks that we care in in, in other ways than uh, than doing our jobs on the way that we do it on a daily basis. Um, the fifth pillar: officer training and education. I'm actually gonna hit this one a little bit more later, but just to give you an overall idea of a general training of what police officers get. Um, police officers go to the full-time police academy for almost a thousand hours. It's uh, five and a half months worth of training. In Massachusetts, previous to the reform legislation that just came out, there were two levels of police officer. There was a full-time police officer, and then there was a part-time police officer. Part-time police officers are only, or were only required to get what they called the Reserve Intermittent Police Academy. This is about a third of the amount of hours that a full-time police officer gets. This is just initial training. Once they have that, they're allowed to work as a part-time officer. They still have to get on the job training. They still have to go through a field training program for most police departments. And then they still have to get what we call in-service training. In-service training is set forth by the state. And there are more than 40 hours of a multitude of different topics um, that we go through every single year. So just to give you an idea for me, uh, when I first started, I went to the Reserve Intermittent Academy. Uh, I was hired as a part-time police officer. Uh, I got my on-the-job training, my in-service training for, I think, one or two years before Chief Huckowitz hired me as a full-time police officer. At that point, I went to the full-time academy. And every year since then, in 20 years of policing, I've received all of those on-the-job trainings, as well as a lot of specialty training. We do things a little bit differently now that I'm the chief. We still have all of that mandated on-the-job training 
But one of the things that I'm going to get into shortly is some of the things that we've added on to aim us in the direction of where that reform bill, I think, wants us to go. Um, and one of the and the last pillar is officer safety and wellness. Uh, we have a kind of a quasi gym here. I actually have an officer certified as a wellness instructor. As I'm sure many of you probably know, uh, the rates of suicide, uh, the rates of divorce, the rates of um, substance abuse, both alcohol and drugs among police officers is some of the highest for any profession. Uh, we try to stay on top of this as best we can. Unfortunately, as I'm sure many of you know, for whatever, it doesn't really even matter what your profession is. A lot of things somehow sometimes get in the way. Um, so we do the best we can with it. Uh, the, the reform bill actually puts forward some interesting things that, that we hope to be able to take advantage of. But again, I kind of I always bring it all, I'll bring it all back to funding uh, as well as uh, you know, availability of personnel, availability of training, and things like that. So we work hard to try to to try to make sure that our officers are safe and our officers stay healthy, uh, but it's just difficult sometimes. Um, so moving on to the, the next question, those are the six pillars and, and that kind of covers really what our best, what, what, what best practices are and kind of where we're heading as an agency. We are, when we become, when we finally get to the, that pinnacle that we're, we're aiming for to try to become accredited, we are gonna be posting I hope, I hope that our town website, and I'm not 100% sure yet, but um, our police department website, as I'm sure you probably know, is underneath the town website, just like all the rest of the departments in town. One of the things that we would really like to do is be able to put all of our policies and procedures right on the website. I hope that it will allow for it. One of the, the, one of the main reasons we've been holding off on that is because we are trying to become accredited. We know that we're gonna to have to make some changes to some of our policies and procedures. And the last thing we wanna do is change it in three different places. So we're still working on, on that project, but we're, we're aiming in that direction to have them right up there, right up front that anybody can look at anytime they want. Um, one of the other questions that, uh, that Pat uh, mentioned was uh, about data collection. Part of the reform bill, as well as, I, I don't know if this question came from the reform bill. Uh, maybe I'm sure some of you probably read it, but part of the reform bill does have a part about data collection, whether it be traffic stops or um, you know, collecting uh, demographics and collecting data uh, of who police officers are stopping. So we've been through this one time before. It was probably Ooh, 20 years ago now, maybe 16, 17 years ago, where the state issued um, these little data collection cards. And every single traffic stop that we made, we had to fill out every, we had to fill out one of these cards. This was probably before the advent of the computer system that most police departments use now. We use a computer system called IMC, and this computer system tracks all of this data. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, I am the vice president of the Western Mass Chiefs of Police Association. Uh, it's one of the largest liaison uh, police chiefs association groups in Massachusetts. I will actually be the president in December. Um, and because of that, I was actually recently just contacted uh, over the weekend by the president of the Massachusetts Police Chiefs, which is kind of the umbrella of which under which we all work. And I was placed on a, uh, I was selected to be placed on a committee that is going to be working with Salem State, as well as um, EOPS, which is the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security. This is the organization where the Secretary of Public Safety, who works right under the governor, uh, is assigned. And part of the reform bill has to do with data collection. And what they were, what the intent is, is that 
they're going to design a way to collect this data appropriately and efficiently. And then they were going to choose a college or some institution to study and kind of present a report on. Well, they selected Salem State. And I was one of, I believe, three or four chiefs uh, in the state that were selected to be on this committee to sit down with Salem State and discuss this process. And one of the reasons that I think, I like to think it's because I, I know what I'm doing, but that's probably not it at all. Um, one of the reasons that I think I was selected was probably because Hadley has a very small population, 55 or so, 100 folks. And we are directly smack dab in the middle of the five college area, which brings 50,000 people um, of a very diverse population to our community, to and through our community. These are the folks that get pulled over, you know, quite often. If any of you watch any select board meetings, you know that Rocky Hill Road and uh, West Street and North Lane, where they just put the speed bumps on, is a through way for folks who are headed to the colleges. So one of the reasons that I think they asked me to be on this committee is because we really need to make sure that we figure out a way to analyze this data appropriately and make sure that the appropriate information is put out there. Um, there are a lot of communities like, for example, Hadley or um, Agawam is another good example where Agawam has a much higher population than Hadley uh, I, would, I think it's somewhere in 30,000, 35,000 folks, um, but they have six flags. So every single day from, you know, September or, or from uh, uh, April or May to September, they have 50,000 folks extra coming to their town uh, every single day. So there needs to be a, an appropriate way to study the data. So that's another kind of another thing that I'm going to be personally involved in. And I look forward to sitting down with those folks and discussing that. And when I get more information, I would love to come back to this group and kind of explain what we've been talking about and, and how they intend on, um, on analyzing the data appropriately. But regardless of all that, our IMC system collects this data. The officers, um, the officers input the data. It comes right from a citation, right from the stop, and it goes right into our system. So the data is already being collected. Uh, let's see. Another question was about hiring practices. So this one kind of goes along with best practices, goes along with policies and, and procedures and things like that. But this one's a little bit tougher because things are changing. Um, the the amount that there there is there 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 is a lot of police officers that are leaving this profession. Um, I get asked quite often to assist Northampton with promotional uh, panel interviews for some of their higher ranking positions, and I was recently over in Northampton sitting down with them to to assist with I think lieutenant interviews, and uh, the chief of police Jody uh, and I are, are good friends. Um, she'd mentioned how many, how many officers they are down, how many folks they're short. And it's a lot. It's a, it's a lot. If it, it's, it's three quarters of my entire department, um, if not almost every, uh, almost every patrol officer. So the problem is, is that there's a lot of officers leaving the profession and the pool of applicants is shrinking. Last month, um, the state police announced, about a month and a half ago now, I'd say, maybe two months, state police announced that they were having another exam. When the state police have an exam, they have a combination exam. It is both a state police test uh, for state police officer and it is a civil service test. So it's a combination between state police and any police department out there that is civil service. So departments like Spring. Field, Civil Service Police Department, Chicopee, those, those places. Um, about a month ago, when I was on the phone, I was actually on the phone with someone from EOPS who works directly under the governor. And we were talking about the state police test because 
I actually, unfortunately, my school resource officer right now is in the process for the state police. Uh, she very well could be leaving uh, at any point. So I was talking to him about that and trying to get a, you know, a time frame on when she may leave. And while we were talking, one of the things that he had mentioned was uh, he said, hey, do you know how many, how many people have actually signed up to take the, the state police exam? And I said, I have no idea. How would I know that? And he mentioned to me that at that point in time, there are usually anywhere between 18,000 and 21,000 people signed up to take that test. And at that point in time, he said there were under 3,000 people that were signed up to take the test. So just imagine that shrinking pool of individuals, and then imagine how hard you have to look to find the right people who are in that shrinking pool to be police. Because you can't just take anybody. You can't lower your standards just because there's less people who want to be police right now. Um, but this affects how we do things when it comes to hiring practices. We have a pretty strict process when it comes to hiring here in Hadley. We do a full background check. We do a full psychological panel evaluation. We do a full medical um, background check. We do a physical abilities test, which a lot of police departments don't really do. Um, and if you pass all of that, then you have to get through the interview process. So I'm certainly not saying that we have the best process, but I like to think that what we look to hire are people, not police. We are looking at the person themselves. We're trying to find the best person. One of the things that, one of the mistakes that I made when I first started this job was, when I became the chief, there was a major problem with the overtime here. Um, I'm sure many of, you, many of you probably are aware that we were spending way too much money in overtime. So my focus at that time was financial, fix the problem. Because when they hired me, they basically told me, you better get this under control or you're not gonna be here for very long. So we did. Um, one of the ways that we did that was to try to find individuals to hire who had experience. We were looking for folks who had the training that they needed, who had the experience that they needed, uh, who had something to do in law enforcement that we wouldn't have to spend a ton of money getting them ready for this job. Uh, that was a mistake. Um, and it wasn't a mistake in that we have people working here now who I regret hiring. We actually have an amazing department. The mistake was that um, we got lucky with the folks that we have because what we should have been doing is trying to find good people and then training them to be police officers. I would now, if I had it to do all over again, and, and the way that we operate right now is <clears throat> we hire good people and we will teach them to be cops. Obviously, that doesn't always work out. We, we may not be able to train someone exactly how to do this job, but we won't be hiring anybody who I can't say is a good person first. Um, I don't look, we do not look for um, experience anymore as a top priority. Uh, we're always kind of looking for what's, be, what's behind that. We want to know what kind of person we're hiring. Uh, and that's the way it's been for the last few years now. And, and as I mentioned, we really, we really are lucky that we have a lot of fantastic people who actually care about uh, the folks that they serve in this department. And one of the other questions was about uh, complaints. I think, Pat, this one was, was kind of specific to you because of, I think, your background in, in uh, your profession. Um, so the question was, was along the lines of if someone wants to make a complaint and it was specific to bias, how do they make that happen? So we don't have a separate and specific complaint process for bias. We just have a complaint process. We accept all complaints. 
Uh, very similarly to how we handle records requests. Uh, records requests can come in anonymous. They can come in on the phone. They can come in via email. They can come in however they come in. We will accept them. Uh, it has no, I, I, uh, we do not care who's filing them. Um, we've had people file complaints on behalf of other people. We investigate every single complaint. The supervisor on duty does have the authority to, if someone say walks in the front door and says, one of your officers just gave me a ticket, I don't like how they talk to me. The supervisor on duty actually does have the authority to talk to that person, sit down with them and see if they can come to a resolution uh, for that uh, you know, low level issues like that. But if there are certain complaints that come in, especially when it comes to bias, um, those are high level complaints. Those are internal affairs investigation complaints. Those are full stop. We need to take a look at this kind of stuff. While I have always had full trust in the officers that I have trained um, in internal affairs investigations, my lieutenant is a fully certified um, internal affairs investigator. He's gone to two different schools on this. I have full trust in him coming to a proper and appropriate conclusion, but I completely understand where the reform bill is going with the idea of post, and I actually welcome post. The post commission, the post commission, one of the one of the things that the reform bill sets forth when it comes to these things is one of the things that the general public should know and that this group will know now is that every single police officer who works here in Hadley will have their entire personnel file sent to the post commission starting July 1. So every single complaint or disciplinary action that I have taken against any officer in my charge will be in the hands of post. After that happens, any complaint that comes into this agency um, has to be sent to post within two business days. And post has the authority to run parallel investigations to our investigations. And we have to send all of the information that we collect for an investigation, and we have to send any decisions we make on disciplinary action for any officers to post. So everything is out in the open. All of that information will be public record. All of that information will be, uh, they're, gonna, they're gonna create a database where these uh, where it can be searched and it can be found if people want to find it. Um, so while I'm not worried about it, uh, like I said, we have some great officers here. I think it will do a service. It will do some good to have folks know that, like I said, I have full trust that Mitch, my Lieutenant will do things appropriately and investigate things appropriately. And we have disciplined officers in the past, but if that's not, good enough and folks don't trust me, which is fine, there will be another layer where folks can go um, to, to gather that information. So Pat, just to, just, just to sum up, sum that part up, um, we don't have a specific you know, box that someone can check for something like that. It's really just a general formal complaint and they can file it any way they wish. And we will, we will look into it. And now with, with post going into effect, there's, the, there's that whole another layer that I discussed, um, which uh, hopefully will help add some, some legitimacy and, and give us some transparency in, in what, we're, what we're doing here. So those were the questions that, uh, that Pat gave me. Um, there's a couple other things I just wanted to touch on really quick. And <clears throat> it's more just kind of a general idea of what I'm about. Uh, and I just wanted to kind of give folks a snapshot into what, you know, what an officer's li life is like at work. Um, we're trying to create a police department here where we focus on service, okay? 
too often for too many years, um, police officers were trained to be warriors out there. They were trained to be fighters. They were trained to be, you know, get the catch the bad guys. And it's a difficult job because sometimes you have to actually be a warrior. You know, if, if God forbid there's a problem, a, a, a crisis situation, a school shooting, all these things, you want that officer to do anything to save your kid. Um, it's hard to change the way that we train folks and it's hard to train them to be a warrior and then flip the switch to be a mentor and then flip the switch again to be you know, a social worker. Um, but we're trying and we're making the effort and I'm gonna get into some of the trainings that uh, that we send, we've been sending folks to over the course of the last couple of years to kind of show that the effort is there. Um, but we're trying to focus on service for everyone, uh, regardless of what they look like or how they talk or any other difference. We want to make sure that Every single person feels comfortable walking up to a Hadley police officer and saying, I have a problem and I need your help. That's kind of the goal. When it comes to me, I want you to know, and this is tough. Again, none of you know me, um, but I am always going to do the right thing. Uh, like I said, you know, you may chuckle on the inside for when it comes to, to, to that, but I'm saying that without pulling punches, I'm going to do the right thing when it comes to this agency. <clears throat> Approximately, some of you may, may know some of this story. I'm just gonna tell you a quick story. About four years ago, we had an officer here who um, struck someone in the cell block when he should not have, and he hurt, he broke the individual's nose. And the officer was put on leave. The officer was, we, we hired an outside investigator to uh, investigate the incident, even though we already kind of knew where we were headed with it because it was hard to watch the video and think that this was an appropriate action. But in order to not be, have the town be sued by the officer, uh, we have to we have to do things appropriately. So we hired an outside investigator to investigate the incident. We, I myself, actually referred this case, the entire case, to our own district attorney's office for charges against the officer. Um, they declined to charge the officer. Um, we cooperated with the full federal investigation to the point where. I was pulled aside in a hallway by one of the prosecutors from the US Attorney's Office and was told point blank that they had never seen that level of cooperation from a police department since he'd worked there. And the prosecutors who we worked with on the case um, were extremely grateful with what they got from us when it comes to documentation, when it comes to cooperation from the officers. And I actually testified against this police officer as well as several other officers here and dispatchers testified for the prosecution because what he did was wrong. Now I'll bet that for those of you who saw the story come out four years ago, or if you remember anything about it, I'll bet a lot of those facts don't sound familiar to you because um, a lot of that stuff wasn't reported and that's okay. And I understand that that's how the media works, um, but I can tell you that that was without question in the six years that I've been the police chief, the most uncomfortable and it was the worst, the worst time I've endured as a police officer um, in my entire career. But what I can tell you is that there was never one second that I ever thought about doing anything other than what was supposed to happen there. So I 
I, you know, I want to, I don't, I want to say something that's going to make me have to knock on wood, but in all reality, I can't imagine something worse, but there was never a moment where I second guessed anything that we were doing as an agency, as a department or as a chief. It was terrible. We went through a rough time. We took a lot of, uh, we, we got a lot of, um, we lost a lot of trust from a lot of folks because of what happened. But that story, that part of that story is, is kind of what I hoped would, would get out to the people that we serve, you folks, and that there was never a question that we weren't going to do the right thing on that. Um, we will always, as a department, work towards doing all of these things that we've discussed here tonight. I don't have a single officer who's pushed back on any of this. They all, they all want to move this department forward to where these six pillars uh, are pointing us. There's not any pushback at all. And I say that because I just, just to give you a snapshot, just to give you an idea of some of the stuff that these officers deal with. <clears throat> After Mr. Floyd was murdered um, and during the height of COVID, I had two officers that were sent to uh, one of the cell phone stores in town for uh, a lady who refused to wear a mask. And the manager called and, and said, there's a woman here who doesn't want to wear a mask. And she just threatened to spit in my face, threatened. She said she has COVID and she threatened to spit in my face. So the officers went down there. <clears throat> they calmed her down. They got her out of the, of the store. And the last parting word to, uh, I believe I had two female officers who were on duty that day. She asked if uh, the officers had killed any N words today. Um, these, this, you know, the officers are trained to deal with this kind of behavior. She was angry. Um, she directed it at the two police officers who were there. Uh, I have an officer who uh, has a purple heart. He got blown up in Afghanistan. He has scars up and down his arms. Uh, I sent him to Northampton um, several months ago for a Purple Heart ceremony that uh, they were having on the front steps, I believe, of City Hall. And um, there were some folks out there who, because he went on duty and in uniform for 10 minutes to be thanked for his service to his country, decided to start chanting F the police uh, while he was on the front steps, you know, accepting his, his uh, Purple Heart award. A couple of months after that, we had an individual who had no license, no registration, no insurance on his car, uh, was being investigated for stalking a young woman, uh, had been sending her sexually explicit text messages, and had previous rape charges, um, was pulled over for all of the motor vehicle infractions that he had. Uh, and after trying to incite a small crowd of people who had gathered to, uh, to cause a disturbance for the officers, uh, threatened on body camera video to come back to the police department and shoot us all in the head. And most recently, it was actually interesting. Uh, it was the night before we were supposed to have our very first meeting. Um, it was the one that got canceled because the time was set up an hour different. The night before we were supposed to have our first meeting, one of my officers pulled over a couple um, in a pickup truck and um, <clears throat> immediately the windows came down this much, cell phone recording, um, swearing at the officers, uh, being rude to the officer to the point where the officer ended up ultimately having to do field sobriety tests on the driver. And um, even after all of the, all of the, uh, the angst towards the officer, I, I won't go into a long diatribe about it, but it was a, it was 15, 20 minutes, half hour of this abuse directed at the officers. 
Um, the officers did an amazing job de-escalating the situation. And ultimately what happened was, is the, the individual who was driving didn't fail the field sobriety tests to the point where the officer arrested him. The officer essentially decided, listen, I'm not gonna arrest you, but I, I can't let you drive. You just didn't do well enough to let you drive. So he was gonna cut him a break. And the young lady who was with him didn't have a driver's license or was also impaired, something, to the, something that didn't allow uh, the officer to let her drive the car. And while they were talking, uh, the individual, basically the officer said, you gotta have somebody come get the car or I have to tow it. So he said, I'll call my mom. Now, mind you, when I say mom, don't envision a 20, you know, 16, 17 year old kid. This is a 30 some odd year old man uh, who has to call his mother. And he, giving the officer more guff, says, you know, my mother's an old woman. She's, you know, in her 60s or 70s and she's not doing well. She's not in good health. And the officer still attempting to de-escalate the situation because tensions were rising again, says, well, I get it. I know it's tough. Um, this officer, mind you, is in his 20s. He's 24 years old. He lost his mother to cancer when he was a, a teenager. And in trying to de-escalate the situation, he says, I understand. I know it's tough. I lost my mom to cancer when I was young. And the woman, the, the young lady, I should say, who was with the person, looked the officer square in the face and on camera, right in the body camera says, good, I'm glad she's dead. She deserved to die. <sighs> that, yeah. Um, that one bothered me more than some of the other ones just because of some personal uh, experience, but uh, that's, that's kind of, it's things like that aren't every day, but that type of treatment to the officers is every day. It's not that bad every day, but um, I don't know many of the officers who can go a day without getting flipped off uh, or have somebody holler out the window at them uh, at a traffic light. So it's not, it's not a good time to be a cop right now. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why going back to what we were discussing earlier, uh, why so few people want to be police right now. And so it's making it so that much harder for us to find those qualified applicants in that shrinking pool. But the last thing I wanted to talk to everybody about after giving you kind of that snapshot of kind of what it's like um, is some of the trainings and some of the things that we still are doing regardless of how tough things are out there. We know We've seen this before. Nobody that I know has ever actually experienced it this bad, but we know what's happened in history. And we know it kind of goes like this. We're in a tough time right now, um, but we're still gonna try. We're still gonna make the effort. And so what I did was is I had, I had about three or four different uh, sheets that I was going to work off of. And what I did was, is I kind of pulled from every one of them, just a short list of some of the trainings that we have had our officers take over the course of the last couple of years. Now, mind you, this started before Mr. Floyd was murdered. Um, this started four, five years ago when I took over, six years ago when I took over as chief. But we are evolving and we're trying to gather more information. We're trying to learn more about the human psyche and learn more about what these officers need to know to be to, so that we can ensure that we, we treat the public equally. We can ensure that when they walk up to a scene, they recognize that implicit bias exists and they recognize how to check themselves if they see it happening. So that's number one on the list, implicit bias. We have had probably three or four different versions of this training, every officer here. 
officers here get de-escalation de training. Um, we are currently uh, certifying every single police officers in crisis intervention. These classes are actually taught by social workers to try to kind of open that door uh, for police officers to maybe recognize that something else is going on in this person's life and maybe let's take a different tact. Confronting biases, it's another one. That's, that's a great training where one of, the, one of the most important takeaways I thought was um, the, trainer, the trainer wanted every single police officer when they walk up to a situation to say, were it not for this person being fill in the blank, would I be taking these actions? It's a, it's a, it seems like a cheesy thing, but it's something simple that police officers can do to maybe, you know, like I said, check that box and say, am I doing the right thing here? Fair and impartial policing is another training. Community engagement, um, police legitimacy and procedural justice, youth interactions, uh, interacting with uh, persons with mental illness, um, Alzheimer's and dementia, specific trainings for Alzheimer's and dementia. And for those of you who have been watching the, the select board meetings, we are one of six departments um, who are currently working with our district attorney's office, and we have started and are already underway in having a restorative justice program here in Hadley. Um, my lieutenant and my court officer are, have been working close with the company that we work with called Communities for Restorative Justice. Um, and we are already referring cases to them. And essentially in a nutshell, for those of you who don't know, uh, restorative justice is another way that we can kind of um, change track uh, on things that don't necessarily need to end up in the court system things that don't necessarily need to end up with punitive measures assessed and just alter course slightly and give the victims, that's another big part of this process, give the victims an opportunity to kind of explain to this offender how that crime made them feel. Um, there's certain crimes that don't qualify for this, you know, crimes of violence, sexual assault, things like that. Uh, they don't qualify for restorative justice, but but it's it's like I said, it's a it's a program that's already underway, and it's something that uh, that we're kind of we're really proud of that we're we're involved in here. And then lastly, um, we are working on what uh, what is called a workforce behavioral intervention program. Um, a lot of people call it an early intervention program, and this is going to hopefully work, I've been slightly hesitant in, in kind of investigating, well, not investigating, I've been investigating it, but I've been slightly hesitant to um, institute a program like this because I just didn't feel like I understood how they work. And in all reality, what it's designed to do is it's designed to highlight any behavioral red flags, so to speak, that are happening with your employees. And it's not just to see if the officer or dispatcher is gonna snap and do the wrong thing. That's part of it. Um, but it's it's also really kind of designed to see if there's any red flags showing that, you know, uh, there's something going on that's that's negatively impacting their work performance. You're not getting a good product from this person. Um, it, it also has to do with conduct, it has to do with attendance, it has to do with safety, uh, wellness, um, and these programs are designed to um, lower organizational risks and, uh, you know, I want to say protect against litigation, but mitigate um, litigation. The one of the one of the things that, you know, the reform bill, unfortunately, is is going to do it is going to open up some avenues for um, people to sue 
uh, law enforcement agencies, specific officers, and the cities and towns that they work for, even if it's just to try it and see if the bill opened up any, any, uh, any way for them to make any money for that. This hopefully will mitigate those risks. So this is one of the things that we're actually working on now. It's something that we're working on, as I mentioned, parallel with all of the, the things that we're doing for accreditation um, and kind of hopefully will be just another one of those steps to show folks that we're trying to be as transparent as we can. We're trying to be as open and honest as we can. The reform bill is going to help in some of those areas, um, but in all reality, even though I will never defend bad behavior, um, I will defend these officers because, you know, like I said, those three or four stories are just kind of a glimpse into some of the things that they've been dealing with. And it's a, it's a tough job. These are, these are human beings. These are young human beings, a lot of them, because these are the people who are just entering our workforce, no matter what your profession is. That's who's coming in right now, your 20 year old folks. Um, and we're asking a lot of them. You are not going to get perfection. These are, these are people. We're not building these folks in a factory or plucking them off of a tree. So we can set these parameters and we can put these things in place to keep oversight as best we can. But without having a crystal ball, if I knew that that officer four years ago was going to do what he did, obviously I would have stopped it. All we can do at this point is put these safeguards in place and continue to try to find the best people for this profession um, so that we can continue to, to build the trust that we hopefully have with uh, the folks that we serve. So that's my presentation. Um, my throat's killing me now, but I am happy to take any questions or anything that we did not touch on. Well, Chief Mason, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, you obviously put a lot of thought um, into your remarks. They're very comprehensive and, and very helpful. And I'll throw out the first question, which is how can we help? What can we do as partners? What can our committee, you know, think about, offer, anything come so, to your mind? Yes, actually uh, there is. Um, you folks, this, this group has already had a meeting with um, H. Am I, am I wrong? Not yet, I mean, not yet. Not yet, okay. Uh, one of the things that I uh, would love to partner with this group on is something that I think you have in your, um, uh, in your, uh, your mission statement or at least uh, your goals and objectives, and that is uh, hiring practices. I, I'm pretty happy, pretty proud, actually, of the diversity that we have within our agency. Um, but I don't think that we can ever be uh, okay to, I, I don't think we can ever be satisfied. I wanna make sure that our agency reflects the, the people that we serve. And while we do have a, a diverse collection of individuals, um, I would, I think recruiting is, recruiting is going to be a challenge as we move forward. I mentioned it a few times, I don't wanna you know, beat a dead horse here, but um, it's not just recruiting, it's recruiting for diversity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, for those of you who, just, just so you're aware, we've had two, we hired an HR director a year and a half ago now, I think, and he's in the military and he actually got deployed and we ended up, um, we ended up having an interim. Deb from, uh, she, she actually was the HR person in Amherst, was amazing. Um, just an absolute wealth of knowledge. Uh, nothing against Ed, our HR director. He's awesome too, but Deb was, Deb was somebody who I wished was here just a little bit longer. So I had a little bit more time uh, to pick her brain. But one of the things that she and I discussed was recruitment. And it was recruitment specifically for diversity. And uh, like I said, I think that working with HR and working with this group, um, once we have a better idea of, 
of exactly what the reform bill is, how the reform bill is going to mold police departments after it's in full effect. Um, I, I would like to have an opportunity to maybe work with this group as well as HR to, to try to tap into some resources that maybe you folks have from your professions um, into this one. So that's, that's like number one for me. And that was one of the ones that kind of jumped out at me when I saw your, your mission statement and your, and your goals and objectives. And I think that that goal and objective is similar to what our new HR director wants to do. Mm -hmm. uh, be involved in recruitment, wants to be involved in hiring processes and practices. Um, and, and like I said, it's not just, not just for, because the pool is shrinking, it's because it's gonna be all that much more difficult to, uh, to find folks who want to do this job, but also, um, you know, find folks who represent the community that they serve. Uh, so that would be, that would be the one that I would be kind of hoping for uh, as we move forward. And it, it might take a little bit because like I said, the, the reform bill is, there's going to be a little bit of a, a lag in <clears throat> working with post, having all of these different committees and subcommittees within the reform bill assigned and then starting to see how the police departments conform with what, what we know the new rules to be. And then we, you know, I wanna be able to jump into that and, and um, we're, we're, we're full staffing right now, but like I mentioned, we have my school resource officers who might be going to state police and you always have retirements and you always have folks who are second guessing this career right now. So it's, it's good to, to have a, a um, you know, uh, that, that outlet to tap into for future employer and for future employees. Other questions for the group? We have a few minutes. Margaret? Uh, just a quick question, Chief. First of all, thank you. This has been so informative, taking pages of notes. Uh, uh, it's been awesome. But um, how long do you think it will take before accreditation happens, given that, you know, you don't have a lot of um, people to help you with, with this? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, Margaret, congratulations. on the <laughs> Thank you. You're going to find, I hope you don't find out real quick that that was a mistake. But <laughs> <laughs> we're over, we're over the big hump right now. So, um, yes. So, uh, uh, self-assessment, generally they give you uh, a two-year time frame to do self-assessment. In larger police departments, uh, uh, I'll give you uh, Amherst and Northampton, for example, are two other police departments who are accredited. They actually have either one or two full-time police officers who are doing this. That's it. That's their job, accreditation. We're, we just, we're nowhere near that. We, we have maybe, my lieutenant, maybe has a, a third of his time to work on these items. One of the things that I had actually requested and, and was approved for right before COVID was to hire a, a civilian administrative staff person to assist with that. It was going to be specifically an accreditation specialist. Um, everybody was on board with it and then COVID hit and everything went out the window. So unfortunately, it's going to take a while we are plugging away at it. Uh, my hope is that we will be certified. And then what we're going to do is this. It, it's sorry to kind of take a step back, but the Massachusetts Accreditation Commission every so often comes out with a new set of standards and they name them, you know, step uh, standard, first, first uh, set of standards, second, third, fourth. We're now on our sixth iteration of the accreditation standards, but they haven't actually posted it yet. So what they've told us is don't get accredited with the fifth set of standards because the sixth one's going to come out and you're going to have to do it all over again. So what we're doing is we're working on everything that we know is going to be in that sixth set. And then as soon as they post those, we are actually going to do the accelerated version. So it'll be all hands on deck to make sure that we are uh, ready to go and everything is all the policies are in place uh, the building has to be up to snuff um, you know they even they walk around from what I've been told the the tour from the accreditation commission 
they usually send a team of folks out. They will tour your facility for two to three hours, checking everything to make sure that you are up to the standards that they have set forth. So my hope is that within a year, within this year, we'll be certified. And then we'll be able to move to the um, accelerated accreditation standards, which from what I understand, once you're certified is not a huge step to get to the accreditation. It's only another 50 or so standards to meet, but um, the big hump is gonna be this first one. My hope is inside of this year, we will be certified by the Massachusetts Accreditation Commission. Great, thank you. I know that Tony Lynn has a question. So if she could unmute and ask her question. Sure, thanks. Um, so it, it seems that we're really lucky to have you as a chief and thanks for the presentation and all of the details. Um, it struck me something you said about expecting police officers to flip a switch. Um, I was just wondering, wouldn't it make more sense to divert some resources to hire a social worker or someone with mental health, specific like mental training and mental health services or career in mental health services instead of you having to do it all? Yeah, um, that's actually something that I've, I've, uh, I've discussed with um, a few of our select board members. Um, it is something that we would really like to investigate. The issue is that the resources can't come from here. I can't give a police officer away in exchange for a social worker. If the town is willing to make the commitment and head in that direction, we would love it. And I'm not even joking. I wouldn't even want just one. I would want 24 hour a day assistance. The mental health calls that we are going on are only increasing. I don't mm. know what it has to do with COVID. I don't know um, exactly what the, what the issue is, but um, they're, they're increasing. Uh, there's a lot more mental health issues. There's a lot more substance abuse issues than there was before. Now, that's not to say that these officers aren't doing a good job with these calls. Um, they're doing a phenomenal job with these calls. The road, the issues at roadside where these officers are dealing with these folks, at least here in Hadley, um, is not the problem. The problem is that there's nowhere for them to get the treatment that they need. Mm. We bring them to the hospital, we get them into the psych ward, we get them into whatever the treatment that they need, whether it's detox or something like that, and we're dealing with the same folks again within a couple of days. Not a big deal. It's part of our job, but I would absolutely love to go down that road and investigate that, um, that ability of that dual response to those mental health issues. Um, that's how I would, that's how I would envision it. That's the, that's, that, that is, that is what I would support. Just, I guess that's the, the best way to say it. I would support a dual response. Um, but like I said, you know, we're talking about a department that has 14 officers, 15, 14, you know, patrol officers. Um, this isn't NYPD with a billion dollar budget where we can, you know, eliminate a program and then hire 50 social workers. So the funding can't come from inside this agency, but I would absolutely welcome it. I think it'd be a, a, a good assistance. But, you know, like I said, the officers really do do a great job. Um, we had an individual uh, who, uh, um, we had an individual recently who we, uh, the, uh, who actually at attacked a couple of my officers. One of my sergeants had two big scratch marks down his, his, his forehead. Uh, and he's now, we, we, we didn't, you know, essentially we've, we've dropped all charges against him because we were able to get him over to Cooley Dick. We were able to get him the treatment that he needed. And he's one of the few folks who, since he's been out, has been medicated appropriately. Uh, he's no longer a threat to his family, which was one of the really one of our bigger biggest things. And so we recently reached out to the DA's office to drop all the charges because it's working. The, 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 this is one of the few times where it's actually worked. So um, it's a it's a tough situation, but I would absolutely welcome having that conversation. Certainly. Thanks a lot. Chief Mason, I think we're out of time. 
Um, but I really want to thank you very much again, unless anybody has any last quick minute question or comment. I think Joanne had her hand up. I think this might be quick. I was just interested in the percentage of calls or whatever you call when your officers have to deal with something. What percentage is, involves Hadley residents and what percentage is people who don't live here? You know, like oh. stuff at the malls and all that. Just well, curious. That's a quick. That's a quick one because I I wouldn't be able to tell you without looking it up. Okay. Uh, I will look it up and I will be I be ha I will. Our 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 record system, the system I was talking about earlier, MC actually does a really good job um, on demographic data. Mm -hmm. I'm not 100 percent sure we would be able to gather data specific to what you asked, but I will absolutely try. And I will reach back out to this group with, sure. uh, with an answer. Thank you. Yeah. Wayne? I just want to thank Police Chief and uh, for this opportunity and for the work you do. And uh, it's very much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate you having me. This was, this was really good. I felt... Uh, you know, I almost felt therapeutic for me to get a lot of that stuff out. I've been holding it in for a while. <laughs> Come again. Come again. Yeah. I had I, I no know. idea. No idea. Gosh, yeah. that's part of the, what we need to do is educate the community what you really do. You yeah. just right. carry guns, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And think yeah. of us as a group, as a resource yeah. to Chief Mason. I think we want to communicate that we yeah. are a resource. We care about the same issues. We want to, you know, provide a safe and just community for residents and those who travel through, yep. through our streets and through our towns. So hopefully we can have another conversation and, and find some ways that we can, we can support you. I would love that. I really would. And I yeah. think we have the same goals. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Um, and thank you for being so kind as to uh, listen to what I had to say. Yeah, and I, I, I wish I would wish this for every town, not just for Hadley. Mm -hmm. And this was recorded, so I may go listen to it again. Okay. Tell yes, people. Thank you. On, on yep. behalf of the Hadley Committee for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, we want to thank Chief Mason for being with us today. And this, this will be going on uh, Hadley Media. So to our neighbors that are not at this meeting, we're really glad that you've tuned in and we invite you to learn more about our committee. We meet regularly, generally the first Monday of the month, plus special guests like tonight's meeting. Uh, but you can always find information about our meetings on the town website. So please join us for another meeting. And thank you to Patricia for hosting this and thank you to Chief Mason again. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.